if you would uh, turn with me. I gave a scripture last week, and the Spirit of God moved so heavily that um, we actually weren't literally able to get into it. You know, um, we weren't able to actually get into into the scripture. Um, and I thank God that um, for his spirit and for us to be able to um, move along with the spirit. But the scripture was very important. So if you would, if you would turn to Luke 14, uh, 25 through 35. Luke 14, 25 through 35. When you have it, as they say in the old school church, say amen. amen. It says, um, Now large crowds are traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be a disciple. And if anyone does not carry his cross and follow me, cannot be my disciple. This morning I want to deal with you on priority. On your priority. You know, I remember there's a song out that came out a while years ago called My Prerogative by Bobby Brown. It's my prerogative. I do what I want to do. And I think we are living by our prerogatives now so more so than our priorities. You ever notice that? We sit back and I, I'm going, I was watching an episode of um, Archie Bunker's place last night. Actually, it was the very first episode of Archie Bunker. It's called Meet the Bunkers. Now, my wife doesn't like the Bunkers. She really, all the family is what it's called. Um, I like Archie Bunker. I, I like the show. And the show is, um, is really humorous to me. And in the humor, it's a political satire humor. And everyone knows that Archie Bunker is this bigot. You know, now he's not a racist. He's just a bigot. You know. Um, but in the show, he has his, his son-in-law is this, you know, left-wing liberal. And his next-door neighbor, neighbor that you all may not know is, is George Jefferson. Because the Jeffersons was a spinoff from that show. And the Jeffersons had a son named Lionel. And Lionel was studying to be an electrical engineer. You know. And Mr. Bunker, I'm just, just said, Mr. Bunker would always make a joke. He says, he would all, whenever he asked Lionel what he wanted to do, Lionel would say, I'm going to be an electric engineer. And he would say it like that. And so, just to make Archie feel good about himself, he says, I'm going to give him what he wants. He says, you give people what they want so you can get to where you're going. He's like, because as long as I, I'm, as long as I keep saying I'm an electric engineer like that, he keeps paying me to do fix stuff around the house. And that money is going towards my college for me to be an electrical engineer. And I look at it, I thought about that, and I said, you know, so often we get caught up on how people view us and how what I'm not going to take it. How dare you talk to me that way? And we miss the greater purpose. We miss because we think that, how dare someone want me to stoop down to that level? Sometimes you just gotta serve. You can't be concerned about everything else. You can't be concerned about everyone else. You have to worry, what you have to do is be concerned about what the Father wants from you. Now here's the funny thing about it. Now and, and going on, and going, going, going on, and I just, I looked at <coughs> so many ways of how we try to be about our own prerogative. And his son made a statement, Archie's son-in-law made a statement and said, you know, only thing you all are concerned about are your 24-inch TVs and your toasters that toast four pieces of bread at a time. And I was like, wow, that was a whole lot. That was a lot. A 24-inch color TV is big time back then, and a toaster that toasted four pieces of bread made you a baller. Can you imagine that? 
in today's times, we up here, we're, we're talking about trying to have a 54 inch TV. Many people hit doorbuster sales this, this past Friday morning, trying to get, I was talking to one lady that was in line. She was in line at Walmart, first one in line. And I said, what are you waiting for? She says, I think it was a 40 inch flat screen TV for her 12 year old daughter's room. I was like, wow. Okay. And she says, well, they have the, it's only for $200 at $199. You know, this is, they had a 32 inch for $50 less, but why not pay the other $50 and give her a 40 inch? And I'm like, wow. I mean, I guess I could see your logic there. But that means all, that means what to who? You know, we do these things and we want to get bigger and better. We want to get the hottest phone out. We want to get the hot, we want to get the best car, the best looking rims. We want to do all of that. But the one thing we miss, the one thing that we really miss is what God wants from us. Have you ever thought about that? We're so concerned about how everybody else sees us. And what else, we, what, what new shoes we got? What's the new purse you got? You know, and in this, he, God is sitting back and says, he says, everybody was walking with him. But everybody's walking with you. They're doing it with their own prerogative. They have their own goals, their own intentions. And this morning, what I want to ask is, what is your intention? What's your purpose for following Christ? I can't answer that. But you can See, he goes and he says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brother and sister, yes, even his whole, whole life, cannot be my disciple. And I love it. He says, cannot be my disciple. Now he says, and we understand what discipleship is. A disciple is. A disciple is one that is being trained up in a way. So you're in training. And disciples, your word is discipline. So you're being disciplined in a way in a course of study to follow. Amen? So what we need to understand is we need to allow ourselves, in all honesty, we need to allow ourselves to truly be disciplines of Christ. But he says he, says he has to hate his mother and his father. And what he meant by that is he means you have to be, you have to make sure that they come under God. No one comes before Christ. He says, if you got to put your family before me, you can't follow me. If you got to put your job before me, you can't follow me. If you got to even put yourself before me, you can't follow me. You're not disciplined enough. How often do we find ourselves putting ourselves before Christ? We find ourselves putting ourselves before Christ in several ways. You know, I've said this before. We find ourselves putting ourselves before Christ when we make excuses of why we can't, we can't even come to worship service. We make excuses of why we're not doing the job that we're told to do. Or even volunteer to do. You want to do a youth program and then you turn around and you don't follow through on everything for the youth program. You don't begin to serve like you're supposed to for the youth program. You don't gather everybody together. You come with great ideas. Some people come to come to pastors with great ideas. Pastor, we ought to do this. Pastor, we ought to do that. Pastor, we ought to do this. But then no one follows through. It's like they give it to the pastor. And then it's like, okay, I'm done. I guess y'all forgot. He's the visionary. The pastor's the visionary. You don't come and you don't dump stuff in the lap and say, here. When you come, you come with a plan and ready to and make that plan functional. And you call yourself a leader. Then get people to follow you. But the reason you can't is because we're not disciplined enough to even follow who we're supposed to be following. There's so many different things that I could be doing. <coughs> and I get pulled different ways. And they're good things. But it's not what God called me to do right now. 
I was talking to someone this morning. I said, can you imagine what you can do when you have your own intestinal fortitude and you charge forward and you move and then you turn around and imagine what happens if you had God charging you. God behind you. How much further you would go. How much powerful you would be. Many of you are walking and doing this on your own account, on your own accord, your own gifts and your own talents. But God's not with you because you're not even on God's course. We look back and I was talking to a young man the other day and he said he wanted a big house and a Bentley and all this other stuff. And I said, how do you plan on getting it? It's good to dream. Dream with a purpose though. How are you going to achieve what you want? And he said, well, I'm going to go in the military. I said, well, that's not going to help you get it. But it's funny. I was talking to someone the other week. And I told him, I said, do you know how I know God is going to bless me? And he said, how? I said, because I'm the witness for God. I'm sold out so much to him. He has no choice but to bless me. He has no choice to give me the desires of my heart because I sold out everything for him. And I did it in front of people. I let people see the suffrage I'm going through so they can see how he's going to uplift me. That's how I know. When I hear things, and I'm, we're out here on this basketball court and it's 30, 40 degrees, and you're dedicated, and then you're studying, and then you're moving forward and we're doing things and those things are coming to pass. You know what the greatest thing about it is? God sees that. And God says, okay, you want to sacrifice yourself for me. And that's all I ask. Sacrifice you for me. How I sacrifice me for you. And he said, I even did it to a point where I sacrificed my life in pain till death. I'm giving you life and giving it to you more abundantly. And then promising you with eternity. You see how we miss that? We do everything else for a temporary fix. We do things we want, as they say, we want trophy wives. We want trophies to show what we've done. But God says, what I give you is eternal. You know, I realized, I remember when my daughter first started cheering, people said, well, they should get a trophy every time they win a competition. They at least they should get an end of the year trophy. I'm like, this is competitive cheerleading. I said, man, my daughter's been in competitive cheerleading since she was like three, four years old. I said, I can't imagine how many trophies she would have and how much junk would be accumulated and how it wouldn't mean a thing to her. What is a trophy? Now, I do like it when they give away jackets. They get, you know, they sometimes give away medals. But you know what? To a true champion, a true winner, it's not about that thing that's tangible, that you can hold. It's about that thing that's internal, that you know. The greatest thing they know is when they've been told they were the winner and they're the best. You know, that's one of the greatest feelings in the world. Can't nobody take that from you. Can you imagine having the same feeling? That's what God is promising you. I will give you that. He says, I will give you that great feeling of being victorious. And can't nobody take it from you. Can't nobody steal it. Can't no fire destroy you. And time won't tarnish you. But that which man gave to you, man can take away. 
I was talking to a young lady and she says, I will never forsake my mother for Christ. Not for God. That's my mother. And I said, that's a dangerous statement. Because God will, will sever that relationship to prove to you that he's God. If he wants you bad enough and that's interfering with what he has a purpose for you to do, watch what God will do. Can you imagine if you're not fit to be Christ's disciple and that's what we're called to do and you're saying I can't follow at that level of commitment. Do you understand what that means? That means that you can't get in the glory and everything that you do is in vain. Every single thing that you do is in vain if you're not serving God. Ask yourself, we've talked about this before, how is it you're serving God? How are you lifting up God? How are you bettering the kingdom? It's not just by coming to church. It's not just by praying. But what are you doing to uplift the kingdom of God? Are you, are you, think about in your conversation, are you loving people or are you tearing people down? I want you to take time out and reflect on your conversations in the past. And then I want you to put this towards your conversation in the future. When you talk about someone, are you saying how good they are or are you talking about something bad about them? It's either one or the other. Somebody has on something. Are you saying now they know they can look better with what they had on, what they should do is this? Are you saying that they look like a shot of mess? Do you offer anything positive to someone? Are you doing it for constructive criticism to them? Are you doing it to make yourself feel better because of what you don't like about yourself? The power in life and death abides in the tongue. What are we doing with our tongue? We have so many excuses of why we do what we do, but we're never serving God the way he called us to. Forsaking all others. You know, Pastor, I can't do this because, you know, um, I, I, I really, you know, me and my old lady, you know, we, we got this thing going on. And I understand, I believe in family. But every week, every day, Pastor, you know, I'm working, I'm working too much. But God is your source. Can he not provide for you? Pastor, you know, I would tithe, but, you know, my money coming in, but it's just not enough. But it's more than what you had, more than what you work. See, it's amazing how we serve God out of convenience but we want him to serve us out of sacrifice we don't we, 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 we don't spend time with God this is a sacrificial walk and if you want greatness you got to put in greatness <coughs> we said it before <coughs> Excuse me. Basketball players, football players, soccer players. They work, they practice seven days a week sometimes. My daughter's high school basketball team, they practice every day last week, except for Thanksgiving. And they practice in the day. We give that dedication to everything else, but we don't give it to God. And we as parents make the dedication for our children, but we don't give it to God. I, I mean, my daughter's a cheerleader. I look at all these people that follow cheerleading. They're on, they're on Facebook, they're on the Fierce Boards, they're on this, they're looking at this website. How often do you, do you spend 10% of your time on your children, the time energy you spend on your children, into God? 
Because actually it should be more time in the God. There's no reason you should know every single of my chilling parents. But you should be able to know every single business going on in all the all-star gyms in Georgia. And you don't even know what's going on in this word of God. You know every single child on your daughter's team. But you can't even name me the 12 disciples. You know how each coach, co each coach teaches and instructs. But you can't tell me the personality of at least five disciples. Men, we, fought, we know the stats of football players, college and professional. But we can't quote 10 scriptures. We can't exegete too. Where are our priorities? Where's your priorities? They're misplaced. So what we got to begin to do is look at what God wants from us. How God wants us to serve. Not how we want to serve. We got to stop saying, okay, this is how I'm going to serve God. And get to the point of, God, how do you want me to serve? And this is how I'm going to serve you according to what you say. And if that means sometimes you got to be an electrical technician or an electrical engineer, then that's what you got to do. When they asked Christ, they said, they asked him, are you the Messiah? Are you the Savior? And he says, thou sayest. Now he could have been big and brawn and struck everybody down. He could have performed a miracle right then. But he didn't. Humble yourself. I don't care if that means people taking advantage of you. Humble yourself. If it means taking chastisement, humble yourself. If it means doing things you don't want to do, humble yourself. If it means keeping your mouth shut when you're requested, humble yourself. It's not about you. It's about God. That's what discipleship is. You know, we're going to do something new in January. We're going to spend 90 days. 90 days of how you're going to serve. Now, it's going to be a task. We do not, everyone's going to be doing a course, starting on a corporate fashion. You know, we'll get it a year. <clears throat> Everybody has these corporate fasts. Everybody serves God and say, I want to serve God this way. I'm, we're, my church, we're doing this. Okay? And they want it, they fast, and, you know, we've done a Lenten fast, a Lenten fast you know. I know many of y'all went to that Lenten fast. We're not doing a Lenten fast this year. Well, we're not doing a Lenten fast in 2013. You know, it was a sacrifice. But I want you all to do a fast. Not even a fast. But a way of life. A lifestyle change. That it becomes a part of you. So when we kick off in January in 2013, we're going to do something very different. In 2013... <coughs> I'm charging everyone a part of Power of Faith. We're going to give 90 days. 90 days to serve God completely. 90 days to dedicate it to the ministry. That means forsaking everything else. That means from your tithing to your time to your talent. Every week there should be a project that you're not only working on, but completing for the ministry. Denying everything else. Whatever your corporate agenda is, outside of your, your work and the things we got to do, we're putting God first for 90 days. 90 days. 
Now, Pastor, does that mean that I can't do this and I have it? No, it doesn't mean that. It means that, but first, you find out what God wants you to do, and then you do that, and you work God into everything that you're doing. 90 days. I want this ministry to be on the first thing off your mouth, talking about God and discipleship and service. 90 days. That's the, I, every single day, all day long. Now to help you with that, we're gonna we're gonna be getting together. We're gonna um, we're gonna make sure everyone has their text and their phone set up. And you're gonna receive a text. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have Sister Matt put it on the calendar and link everyone's calendar. So it's gonna be some things on your part. I'm saying it now. So we have we have 31 days, about 31 days to get it together. So what's gonna happen every day? You're going to have a scripture and a purpose. But for 90 days, we're putting God first. Sounds easy, doesn't it? Okay. 90 days. When you wake up in the morning, before you begin to get an attitude, you think about what does God want from me? 90 days living according to God, according to scripture. 90 days of you not saying, well, I'm not Christ. But 90 days, you killing yourself to be just like him. <laughs> 90 days. If you do this, no one sitting here will be the same creature. Amen. He said, forsaking all others. That means when you get ready, to, when, when your job says, listen, I want you to do this. Well, hold on. I hear you. But is this going to interfere with what I got to do with God? Well, God wants me to do this and I'm doing this in the ministry. You know what? I know I'm doing my job, but listen, you gotta, if you want me to work, this is the time I can work because I got this to do first. Pastor, you saying you want me to tell my employer that I can't do overtime because I got something to do with the church? Where is your faith? That's exactly what I'm saying. Oh, this is a radical thing for me to even say. Ninety days. Ninety days. It's gonna be hard if we got kids. I know. My child's gonna go. Dad didn't want to go to this party, but no, we got something we're doing. Ministry. Ninety days. You too. Ninety days. Ninety days. And here's the thing. It doesn't mean just going through the action. You gotta have your mind and your spirit right. 90 days. 90 days of faithful 100% tithing. 90 days. No, and it just hit me. God, thank you. I know, I know, I know. Because there's some people out here that are watching this and they say, yeah, yeah, he did it at the right time. I, he just said it. That's what it was about. It's not about tax time. And it just hit me that I know I forgot how some of my people are that y'all watch and y'all look for every angle that the preacher gonna come at. It's not about tax time. It's not about oh yeah he said it then because ninety days gonna cover the whole tax period, you know. So that means that they gotta make sure they tie their taxes right. It ain't about that. So I'll put that out there. But yes, ninety days of faithful tithing, ninety days of faithful giving offerings, ninety days of sacrificing. 90 days. See, I'm going to tell you something. I watched some people this week bless, and, I, and I'm not one of those pastors that sit back and say, I'm the gifted. You know, you, you pour into me. Everything is great. But I'm going to tell you something. I, God showed me how he's got to bless some people that actually sacrificed and blessed me this week. Because they didn't have to. And I watched it. It was a one. And God showed me. He's like, watch this. I got something for them. They don't even know it. Don't even know it. They don't even know what I'm about to do. 
just because of that. But 90 days, 90 days of positive speech. 90 days of positive speech. That means 90 days, we're not going to say anything negative about or towards anyone. We're going to speak life. 90 days of, I don't like her. 90 days of, no, I don't like him. 90 days of, no, I don't, they get on my nerves. 90 days of none of that. 90 days of going to people that you have problems with. It says, help me find a way to love you. Oh, Jesus, thank you. Can you imagine that? Going to people and saying, help me love you. Can you imagine that? And being able to take what they say, I don't need you to love me. And all thing he says, but I need to love you. And God needs me to love you. Can you imagine that? Help me to love you. That means it's a, it's a commitment on both parts. And you got to wear him down like Urkel. Because see, there's something inside of you that they love. Think about it. Stefan was always inside of Stephen, wasn't he? For those that don't watch Family Matters, Urkel, Stephen Urkel, Stefan, and you know, he did this transformation. I'm a big TV buff. Um, and he did and he created this machine where he was able to transport his in his um his uh uh um his his alter ego, thank you, thank you. His alter ego take over. And Laura loved the alter ego Stefan. Because he was confident, bold, and <laughs> smart. But it was still Stephen. It was still Stephen. So there was something about, but he had to watch this. He had to channel deep inside himself to get to show her that there was a part of him that she would love. Can you imagine getting that close to somebody and said, I'm going to channel so far inside of me so you'll find, so you'll see there's something inside of me that you can love. That's love. <laughs> 90 days. I heard, I, heard, I heard people say, my daughter said it, someone said it. I don't need, I have enough friends. You never have enough friends. There's no such thing as having enough friends. Never. Can you imagine, by you saying you, you, you had enough friends, you know what you're really saying? You're saying you're done, you're done trying to reach people and evangelize and disciple people. Can you imagine that? So what's your purpose? If you're done making friends and building relationships, your life here is now over. God needs you no more. So if you're ready to go into glory, just go ahead and do that. But I hate to break the news to you. If that's your attitude, then glory is not your destination. <laughs> Let the church say amen. amen. It is about building relationships. That's what it's about, relationship building. And you better do it. You better love it. So that's what it means by forsaking all others, putting all this first before your family, your friends. It's the God. He said, even, he says, even yourself, if you got to put yourself, people say, why were you out here with the flu? Why were you there with the flu? Why were you on the prayer call with the flu and out here doing all that? But then you wouldn't go nowhere else because I had to deny myself for God. Didn't nobody else see me? My daughter was talking to me. She said, daddy, we still haven't gone to my birthday dinner. I said, I know, but I don't want to be at the table coughing. You know, <coughs> all day long at dinner. 
But, because I why why did I want to be coughing all day long at dinner? Because I don't want to bother anybody else. But guess what? I don't care about y'all when it comes to God. Amen. I do what he say do. You know? I'm serious. It's a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice. I had to share with someone that said, I've sacrificed everything for this ministry. I was talking to um, a friend of mine, and I was telling them, it was like, you know, I don't know what to tell them because you normally are private, but now you're just telling everybody all your business. I said, yeah, I'm going to let them know now. They got to know. And it's not, to, it's not to boast me up. It's for you for people to know, well, if he's doing it, then I can do it. If he can sacrifice everything, then I can. You want to know why some pastors, when they make it, and their churches are doing well, and people say, why they have a... It's, you can't tell them nothing. They don't want to hear anything. Well, because they sacrificed. We don't understand it. I'm, I, I'm giving y'all ground level. And, you know, for y'all, like you all that know most of the market, you're on the ground floor. Ground level information that you don't find out or you may never find out. I'm giving it to you now. We bust and we sacrifice like any other businessman that makes a great company. So we don't understand the excuses that people give. Because they want greatness, but you don't want it, but greatness costs. What, I remember the conversation they had with Jesus. I want to sit at the right hand, I want to sit at the left. He was like, man, please. Before you sit at my right or my left, you got to go through what you got to drink from this cup that I'm drinking from. You got to drink from this cup I'm drinking from. Half y'all don't want to drink from that cup. That's one challenge. You that's just like, pass me by. <laughs> Ninety days. Ninety days of loving people. Ninety days of no attitudes. Ninety days of no cursing. I know for some of y'all that's hard. Now, now, let me say this. <laughs> some of y'all, some of y'all use curse words and not cursing. I understand. But you know what I mean. No cursing, folk out. Not even intellectually cursing them out. Okay? 90 days. I'm giving y'all a head start. Am I not? I'm giving y'all y'all got one month <laughs> to get it out your system. <laughs> you can go home and be like, that's the money. Y'all can speak all the tongues you want to speak in that bathroom and get it out your system. Okay? For those of you that, 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 that smoke weed, 90 days and no weed. <laughs> For those that get drunk, 90, 90 days and no liquor. 90 days, 90 days, 90 days. You know? Uh, 90 days, 90 days means 90 days of, that means I told y'all on, on the first call, no, no bad mouthing your leaders. No bad mouthing teachers, educators, pastors, employers. <laughs> Nothing negative said about them. And no, that doesn't mean you just don't say nothing. See, some of us saying, or oh, just say, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut then. No, you got to speak positive things. Every time you feel that there's something negative you want to say, you got to say something positive. You get no. I love you and you have a lovely spirit. And I like the way that you challenge my spirit to be better. <coughs> See, you say that. Instead of saying, you're getting on my nerves. Yeah, I see the looks you give me. <laughs> No, we can't walk away from it. Whenever someone vexes you, 
Et Serge Chegron. Il est sébé qui sait. Thank you for showing the weakness inside of me. And I love you. See, y'all better get some scriptures. Now, going into this 90 days, I charge every member of Power of Faith to give me 10 scriptures of affirmation that I help your brothers and sisters in these 90 days. We may use them, I may use them, may not. Don't worry about it. But at least 10. 10 scriptures of affirmation. <coughs> Excuse me. So, I want those 10 to be turned in no later than the 20th of December. Affirmation. 90 days. Y'all ready? Let's get to it. 90 days. Putting God first. Forsaking all others. We're going to thread the eye of a needle. Matter of fact, that's what our fast is. That is what the fast, it will be an eye of the needle fast. Because he said it's easier for a camel to thread the eye of a needle, to go through the eye of a needle, the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the gates of heaven. Rich doesn't always mean financial. It also means bount it means bountiful. And the problem is some of us are too bountiful in our flesh. Now, I want you all to get everybody on board with this. Send this fast to your friends. Get everybody can you imagine if we just if, if we if each one of us got 30 people to take on that or just 10 people to take on the fast with us. 10 people to take on that same fast. And I have a needle fast. What that would do in your life. And what that would do to people around. Already we're talking about over 300 people. Amen? Amen.